Welcome to STEM Talk. 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 Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Welcome to STEM Talk. My normal co-host, Don Kernagas, is playing hooky today. Actually, she's on travel. And thank you so much, Tommy Wood, for stepping in. Hi, Ken. Uh, great to be here. Our guest today is Dr. Jason Fung, a Toronto-based nephrologist and the best-selling author of The Obesity Code, The Diabetes Code, and The Cancer Code. Jason is best known for his success in combining a low-carb diet with intermittent fasting to help thousands of overweight patients reverse their type 2 diabetes, lose weight, and improve their metabolic health. Jason is the author of the blog, The Fasting Method, and the co-founder of the Intensive Dietary Management Program, an initiative that provides low-carb dietary guidance and counseling on various fasting regimes. Before we get to our interview today with Jason, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the moniker Science Fan Sheila. It's titled Bravo. It reads... Bravo on another excellent STEM Talk conversation. The recent episode with Dr. Greg Potter was immensely illuminating. The science of circadian rhythm was fascinating to learn about, and I simply cannot wait until part two of this episode airs. Many thanks, as always, for giving scientists the spotlight for their work and its application to our everyday lives. Thank you, science fan Sheila, and thanks to all our other STEM Talk listeners who have helped STEM Talk become such a great success. Okay, and now on to today's interview with Dr. Jason Fung. STEM Talk. 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 Jason, you were born and raised in Toronto, and I understand that as a child you excelled in math and science. What was it about science that particularly intrigued you? Well, thanks for having me on, first of all. And uh, yeah, in terms of science, I mean, it was always sort of intuitive for me, so I guess being good at it uh, made me like it more. But I also really liked the idea of trying to find out how stuff worked. So when I was younger, of course, it was more like, you know, planes and dinosaurs and stuff. And then uh, when I went into medical school, uh, what I what I really was interested in more than anything else was pathophysiology, which is sort of how disease happens, not necessarily how they're treated, but what causes it, how does it develop, and so on. And, you know, I was really interested in it but i've I, you know not a lot not everybody was interested in it some people were more interested in sort of the treatment side of things or you know the emotional side of things and those are all important but to me it was always more about the puzzle of how things develop you know trying to bring that into the the treatment and that's what i really liked about science it's sort of like a puzzle to me so i, I like puzzles i like jigsaw puzzles i like sudoku you know that kind of thing so it's it's it, to me it's sort of a riddle that that needs to be solved it's a little bit ironic since you've written several bestsellers, but I hear that you also weren't particularly fond of English and writing when you were in school. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really uh, like it. It, it. To me, it was not, again, my strength. So I was more into the sort of um, the questions and not necessarily about the writing. But what happened was very strange because as you try to explain things, it's a funny thing, but when you try and teach something, it not only teaches somebody else, but it also clarifies stuff in your own mind. And writing to me was very much the same. So as I started writing my blog, it was not only an opportunity to teach other people things, but also to clarify my own thoughts. And that's why I wound up doing a lot of writing, because it was very uh, good for for me to be able to try and explain stuff in a very clear, concise way. And that's why I wound up doing a lot of writing, found that I actually enjoyed it, and I was able to explain stuff very clearly to people that they appreciated. Um, but it's, it's yeah, it's it, English was like my worst subject in high school. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
After graduating from high school, you stayed close to home and attended the University of Toronto, entering medical school just after turning 19 years old, and then had a relatively conventional medical training in internal medicine and eventually specializing in nephrology. What intrigued you uh, about nephrology? Why did you become a kidney specialist? It was much the same sort of thing. So each specialty has its own distinct personality, if you will. So internal medicine, um, of which nephrology is a subspecialty, they have a sort of reputation as uh, people who like to think a lot about stuff. Like, you know, it's sort of an intellectual specialty in that certain other specialties like surgery are very action-oriented. And, you know, if you break a bone, if you're an orthopedic surgeon, it's no big mystery what happened, but you want to fix it. So that's that's their sort of uh, bent on things. Nephrology, so internal medicine is sort of a, a thinking person's uh, specialty, but nephrology especially so, as a opposed to some of, again, the more action-oriented uh, internal medicine specialties like gastroenterology or cardiology, where they're going to do scopes or they're going to do angioplasties, interventions, uh, you know, ablations, that kind of thing, uh, technology. Nephrology is sort of more about the puzzle, again, trying to figure out acid-base problems, electrolyte problems, and that kind of thing. So again, it was that aspect of, um, you know, the puzzle that really always intrigued me, even though the treatments weren't great and really probably haven't changed in 15, 20 years. It's not an area that sees a lot of progress uh, compared to some of the others. After med school, you took off for the Pacific Coast and UCLA and spent two years there completing your specialty training in kidney disease at Cedar sinai Medical Center. What led you to decide upon UCLA? I was looking for something different, uh, basically. You know, I spent a lot of time in Toronto, and a lot of the East Coast schools were very similar in that way, so I wanted to try something on the West Coast. It turns out that they have quite a bit of different ways of looking at things, different diseases that they focus on. UCLA at Cedar sinai in particular was very big on renal pathology, for example, and they also did a lot of uh, stone disease, which I hadn't done a lot of in Toronto. So that was the idea, was to sort of just complement round out my training because different areas, different schools have different sort of focuses. So in order to learn all the different focuses, I wanted to get out to the West Coast. I really enjoyed it. It was a great, you know, it was a great city. It was a great uh, time. It was a great hospital. So I really, really enjoyed my time there as well. After your time at Cedar sinai you returned to Toronto and since 2001 have been practicing clinical nephrology there. In those early years of your practice, you saw patients with type 2 diabetes and prescribed medications to keep their blood glucose low. When that didn't work, you prescribed insulin, as countless other physicians have done and continue to do so. So what was your experience? The experience I had was pretty typical, I think, from most uh, places. The main focus at the time, of course, with type 2 diabetes was giving lots of medications and therefore controlling the blood sugars through, you know, at the time there were less uh, medications available, but insulin was uh, one of the big ones. So that was sort of um, how we were taught. We focused in on the sort of blood glucose. And I didn't really clue in that there was a bit of a disconnect there because one of the things about insulin, of course, is that its most prominent sort of side effect is weight gain. So we have a disease, type 2 diabetes, for example, that is made worse when you gain weight, is clearly obesity related. And uh, we're giving a, a, a treatment that was focused on lowering blood glucose, but it was making the patient gain more weight and therefore the disease was getting better. And I guess I never thought about it that way, but a lot of my patients did. And uh, that was, you know, one of the things that I look back on now and I think, wow, that's really, you know, it it was really a very basic concept that I should have picked up on, Mm. but I didn't and neither did, you know, all the other (laughs) doctors out there and universities and all that, they weren't focused in on that sort of very important contrary piece of information. Following up on this, in 2008, two landmark studies were published, the ACCORD study and also the ADVANCE study, which were followed by two more studies, ORIGIN and VADT. And all four of these demonstrated that using blood glucose-lowering medication for type 2 diabetes didn't necessarily have the expected benefits. 
Can you talk about these studies and how they were eye-opening for you and sort of confirmed your own experience that you just mentioned in treating patients? Yeah, so up until about the 2008, the first of these studies, almost everybody thought that the high blood glucose was what caused all the problems with diabetes, type 2 diabetes. So what we were taught was that if you have a high blood glucose, it's going to sort of glycate a lot of the proteins and therefore it's going to cause disease. So if you could just lower the blood glucose, then you're going to get less disease. It seemed a pretty reasonable hypothesis. So those studies really set out to prove it. And they were incredibly expensive, very well done, you know, multi-center, lots of very impressive people on it. So essentially, they it was a randomized control trial. So really the gold standard, they took two groups of people, they randomly assigned them to one of two treatments. One, they just said, do whatever you normally do. And the other group, they said, we're going to give you a lot of medication to get that blood glucose really low, very, very close to normal. So they gave them a lot of insulin predominantly, as well as other other drugs, and they were successfully able to lower that blood glucose. But that wasn't the question. The question wasn't whether we could lower the blood glucose. We knew we could do that. The question is, did it lead to less heart attacks, less strokes, less heart disease, less, you know, blindness, less amputations, less kidney disease, that, that all the complications of type 2 diabetes. And the first study that came out, uh, the ACCORD study, was basically a real slap in the face because not only did it not show any benefits, there was actually an increased risk of death when you treated people the way we were treating people. So we're spending all this time and effort lowering blood glucose, and yet people were doing, if not the same, worse than if we just did nothing at all. And that was confirmed with all those other studies. And it was a complete shock to the uh, sort of uh, establishment. And what happened, of course, was a little disappointing. At that point, people should have reevaluated the predominant sort of prevailing notion of what type 2 diabetes is. But nobody really did. We just kept on treating patients the way we're treating it. And I remember thinking for years, I was thinking, don't they understand the whole treatment paradigm has just been completely upended? Like, do you not realize that the way we thought about type 2 diabetes has been completely shattered? Like, it's not about the blood glucose causing problems. You know, that's where I got interested in the puzzle, because this was a real conundrum. This was something that didn't fit. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more I realized, and there were a few people talking about it, but the majority of doctors were not. They were saying maybe it was be there too many hypoglycemic episodes, maybe this, maybe that, but clearly they weren't on the right track. They're just making excuses. But the point was that if you take uh, that blood glucose and you give somebody insulin, where does that glucose go? Like all you've done is you've taken this glucose that was in the blood, you shoveled it into the body because you never got rid of the glucose. It just went into the liver, the liver turned it into fat, and you gained weight. So you know, the whole problem is that if you're going to gain weight, then your type 2 diabetes is going to get worse. So you have this vicious cycle. You have type 2 diabetes. If you treat it with insulin, you're going to gain weight, which is going to lead you to worsening type 2 diabetes, which is going to lead you to take more insulin, which is going to lead you to worse type 2 diabetes, right? It's a vicious cycle. You get worse and worse and worse. And that was exactly what was happening to all of these patients. And, you know, patients knew it. They knew, hey, I've just gained 50 pounds from the insulin you gave. So uh, the whole idea was that you have a disease, which is type 2 diabetes, which causes high blood glucose. That's the symptom. That's not the actual disease, right? Just like if you have an infection, it can cause a fever. But the fever is not the problem. The infection is the problem. So we mistook the symptoms, which is the high blood glucose, for the disease, which is type 2 diabetes. And we were treating the symptoms and expecting disease to get better. And it never did, but we never should have expected it. Because even when you look back, it's clear that you weren't treating the disease. If you weren't losing weight, your disease was not going to get better. Because it was, you know, everybody knew, like everybody and their uncle knew that it was an obesity-related disease. So that's when I started to really get interested in the question of how to lose weight because obviously (laughs) the solution 
is very simple, except that, you know, you're not taught this as a doctor. But if you're overweight, which leads you to type 2 diabetes, which leads you to complications of type 2 diabetes, well, you can't just treat the complications, the heart disease, the kidney disease. You have to reverse the type 2 diabetes. And everybody at the time, of course, was saying that type 2 diabetes was an irreversible disease. And that was completely a lie. Everybody knew it was a lie, but everybody kept saying it anyway. Because everybody knew that if you lost weight, your type 2 diabetes would either go away or get better, like much better. So the key was to lose weight. And that's where I got very, 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 very interested in that question, because that's the only way that you're going to prevent the type 2 diabetes, which is going to prevent the complications of type 2 diabetes. And then as I dug into the question of weight loss, again, the focus of what I had learned, which is mostly about calories, restricting calories, I just realized once again that it was a complete mess. Like it was the field was just not on very solid footing. People kept insisting that it's all about calories, all about calories. You just have to cut calories. It's like, okay, but you know, people have been doing that for 50 years to extraordinary failure, like the failure rate of calorie restriction for weight loss is somewhere on the order of 95 to 99%. So why would you recommend a treatment that has a 99% failure rate? It's ridiculous. So that's where I started to talk about insulin, the hormones, and then uh, intermittent fasting as well. So related to all the things you've mentioned, Jason, in 1972, Robert Atkins published the Dr. Atkins Diet Revolution, which shared his findings on the effectiveness of low-carb, high-fat dieting. Then, in the late 1990s, a string of Atkins-style diet books surged in popularity. You and most other physicians were aghast at this because you were convinced that these high-fat diets would cause heart disease. Several trials were actually launched in the early 2000s to prove this precise point. Can you talk about how these trials revealed that this storyline is maybe more nuanced than most people might think? Yeah, I mean, it it was very interesting because we went through this period where people thought that we should eat very low fat. Like if you could lower the fat in the diet to very close to zero, then you would basically not get heart disease. And this was sort of, uh, there's been a few people who have said this over the years, but certainly in the 80s, people thought that the low fat diet would cure everything. There was something in the, uh, you know, what I was taught in the 90s, which is a step one and step two diet. Basically, if you had a heart attack, you'd go to a very low fat diet. If you had another heart attack after that, you'd go to a very, very low fat diet, less than 7% fat in the diet, which is extremely low fat. And it turned out that that wasn't true. But by the time these Atkins style diets started resurging in popularity in the 90s, we were still in this throes of this sort of, you know, an, an intense fat phobia sort of thing. And there was a, something, of course, at the time called the French paradox, which was that the French, who are eating all this foie gras and butter and full fat dairy and cream, you know, they were eating a very high fat diet and very high in animal fats compared to what Americans were eating. And yet they had something like a third of the rate of heart disease. And everybody thought this was this incredible paradox. How could you eat fat and get and not get heart disease? Turns out there was no paradox at all, of course. Um, a lot of those natural fats just didn't cause heart disease. So that's the, you know, that was, that was why the Atkins, there was sort of this um, intense sort of dislike of the, the, the Atkins diet, but then it did push a lot of people to look at the fats in the diets. And of course, by the 2000s, you started getting a lot of data coming out on nuts, for example. Nuts are very high in fat and nut consumption was associated with better heart health, for example. So then you started to get all these healthy fats, which was important because in the 90s, every type of fat was considered bad for you. Avocados were like, oh my God, you can't eat an avocado. You'll get a heart attack. Now, of course, we know that avocados don't cause heart attack. They're actually quite healthy for you. Same with salmon. Salmon is a very fatty fish and people are like, oh my God, you can't eat that. Um, so, so in the 2000s, there was this sort of whole idea that you had healthy fats to distinguish it from unhealthy fats. And now, of course, we see that, in fact, the data sort of linking, uh, dietary fat consumption and heart disease is very, very sketchy. 
a lot of people don't even think it exists. So yeah, it was an interesting uh, time. And at the time, of course, people were cutting back their carbohydrates because the problem when you eat a very low fat diet is that fat and protein tend to go together. So then you're eating a very high carbohydrate diet. And it's fine if you're eating beans all day long, but people in America anyway were not eating beans. They were eating refined carbohydrates. They were low fat, yes, but they were highly refined and mostly, you know, carbohydrate. And then you had this sort of explosion in obesity. And that's where those sort of diets became very interesting. It did push a lot of research towards, uh, you know, that resurgence of the uh, Atkins style diets did push a lot of that resurgence into the interest in looking at fat and its role, dietary fat and its role in things like heart disease. So a lot of, a lot, there was a lot of good that sort of came out mm -hmm. of that for sure. Jason, I think an interesting point to make here is that even though you and countless other doctors were naturally appalled at the notion that high-fat diets were being promoted as safe and effective, you had really received almost no nutrition training during the years of medical school, and we hear this over and over. That's something that needs to change, though I, I do worry about most medical schools teaching more nutrition because I think mostly they'll do it badly. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, how do you think about that? What's your view on that? I think you're right. I mean, there definitely has to be uh, more education. The The problem is, of course, uh, when you don't teach nutrition is that doctors don't see it as their role to know anything about nutrition because they didn't learn it in medical school and they don't learn it in residency. So they therefore, they don't see it as their job necessarily to do this. But it actually has a huge role. Being overweight plays a massive role in all kinds of diseases, heart disease, strokes, type 2 diabetes with its, uh, you know, kidney disease, amputations, blindness, infections, even COVID. If you're obese, you're, you're at much higher risk. Lung disease, joint disease like arthritis, back pain, like practically every disease we deal with these days is related to obesity. Cancer, there's 14 different types of cancer, uh, obesity-associated cancer. So, uh, you know, the whole idea that, that physicians have basically given up the field to, to, to Jenny Craig is, is just appalling that we could learn so little about something that's so important to human health. And we spend so little time thinking about it. We just think about drugs and drugs and drugs. And it's partly because of this whole pharmaceutical influence on medical schools. You know, as medical schools look for funding, the, the drug companies were happy to do it. You know, you have drug companies giving all these talks. They've basically taken over all of the major conferences, for example. You know, you can't go anywhere without the influence of pharmaceuticals. And they, of course, want you to focus on pharmaceuticals because that's what they're selling. They don't necessarily want you to focus on nutrition. They don't really care about that. That's not their bag. So, you know, that, that does have to change. I think, you know, until you get physicians more interested in nutrition and uh, its impact on health, you're not going to see that real, you know, improvement because we're also focused on drugs. I mean, I remember listening to a story about the, they're talking about one of these uh, weight loss drugs that just recently uh, had a very, very impressive benefit. And somebody who was there at the American Diabetes Association was saying, oh, the doctors all stood up and gave them the longest, loudest standing ovation I've ever heard. It was like for a drug, like this is what doctors think about. It. Like now I have a drug to give. It was like, but you can give good dietary advice, and you should have been giving good dietary advice. And it's not impossible because you know that in the 70s, there was much less obesity. So it's not an impossible, you know, job to get people to lose weight. But yet, the doctors just want a drug. You know, it's, it's, it's the focus is just all all wrong. And um, I don't even think they see the problem. Like the universities don't see the problem. The physicians don't see the problem. The medical students don't see the problem. A few do, but very few. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, and, and really the, the, the leaders in sort of uh, driving the, the, you know, the, the discussion about health and so on, in terms of all these things, low carb and dietary fat and that kind of thing, it's, it all comes from outside the medical community, which is, which is, you know, not the way it should be. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, it seems to be the case. Yeah.
So Jason, your own realization that type 2 diabetes was largely a dietary disease and therefore required a dietary solution rather than a pharmaceutical one led you, along with Megan Ramos, a medical researcher, to establish the Intensive Dietary Management Program in Scarborough, Ontario in 2011. The two of you counseled overweight and obese patients to follow a low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet in order to reduce their own insulin levels. So what happened? It was very interesting because about sort of around eight, nine years ago when I started talking about intermittent fasting, everybody thought I was completely insane, like completely insane, because it was common knowledge, is widely accepted, that not eating for more than a couple of hours was really, really bad for the human body. That was the prevailing view. So even if you're 500 pounds, you should still put something in your mouth every two hours. That was the sort of prevailing view. So the idea of going going more than sort of like 10 hours without eating was just put people, uh, you know, gave people seizures, basically. And so it's it really insane. But, you know, when I looked at the data, I said, there's no problem with any of this. And as a physician, I had been using fasting for a long time. People who go for colonoscopy have to fast. If you're pre-op, you have to fast. If you're post-op, you have to fast. If you go for fasting blood work, you have to fast. So I, I fast people all the time and nothing bad ever happens. So the question was, why can't you use it in a therapeutic manner? That is, get it, get them to lose weight so that they can improve their health, because that's what medicine is all about. It's not about giving drugs necessarily, it's about giving the right treatment. So I started using this, and, and I tell you, it was just like, I just, I just saw the most incredible things. People were getting better, like that I never thought could get better, because I had believed, along with every other physician, that type 2 diabetes was this chronic and progressive disease. I had one fellow who I treated for like the previous 10 years, who was on like a hundred and 10 units of insulin or something like that. And I said, well, you should try this intermittent fasting. I'm going to give you a schedule. I'll tell you what to do with your insulin. He came off in a month. He came off all of his insulin. So he went from a very high dose of insulin to no insulin. And in fact, he became non-diabetic. So I treated him for 10 years as a diabetic on high doses of insulin when it was all wrong. I was all wrong. It was just eye-opening. And if I treated him right, then maybe his body wouldn't have sustained the amount of damage. And I just kept seeing case after case after case. And people were just reversing their type 2 diabetes in a month, a month and a half kind of thing after they had it for 10 years. So it was just, it was just crazy. Like it's not fun for sure. People prefer to eat. I get that. But there was lots of people who didn't want to have kidney disease, didn't want to have heart disease. And for them, that motivation was there to reverse their type 2 diabetes. And they could do it in a completely natural way using an intervention that has been used for thousands of years. And that to me was like, wow, the, the power of this, when you actually bring the right information to these people, the power to do some good is just incredible. So that's that's uh, sort of what we did with the, the, the intensive dietary management clinic was to try and make it easier for these people mm -hmm. to do the fasting. It's now an online program at thefastingmethod.com. You can get coaching. You can, there's communities. There's programs to help you because doing it is simple. I can tell you in like 30 seconds, right? Don't eat, right? That's the bottom line. So choose an interval, 16 hours, 24 hours. Choose, you know, how often you're going to do it, you know, three times a week, four times a week, and then just don't eat. But sticking to it is a different thing altogether. If you're not, if you're doing it alone, you're, it's not going to be so successful. So we're trying to provide the community, provide the education and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing a lot of people get benefits and very gratifying. It, it really, um, you know, I'm really heartened by it. It's good to hear. So then as these pieces came together and your patients started successfully losing weight and getting off their medications, you began giving lectures around Toronto and you posted a six-part lecture on the etiology of obesity on YouTube and started a blog, as we mentioned, it's called Intensive Dietary Management. You had good feedback, and I understand this is what opened the door for you to write your book, The Obesity Code. Yeah, so I, I, I lectured to a lot of physicians, and physicians in the audience that listened to me sort of immediately understood what I was talking about, because I, I tend to speak in a lot of 
pathophysiology, which they understand, uh, sort of mechanisms of disease and so on. And just trying to point out that, you know, what we're trying to do with intermittent fasting is nothing abnormal. And of course, they had the same experiences I had, which is that you're, you're, you're using fasting, you know, not in those words so much, but, you know, if you keep somebody NPO, which is nil per os, which is sort of standard in hospital, post-op and so on. Um, they knew that nothing really bad happened to him. Um, the other thing that a lot of people had the experience of was people who got very sick in the ICU, didn't eat for a while. Very often their diabetes just sort of went away. And then as you started feeding them again, it all sort of came back. So they sort of understood what I was talking about. So that's where um, a lot of them became very interested in it. And then one of them contacted the publisher who said, oh, this is this is great information. I think everybody really should hear this. So that's when they contacted me and suggested, hey, you know, you should write a book about this. And I said, sure, mm-hmm. because I had written all those blog articles anyway. So I took them and of course, you know, polished them up, made them made them into a sort of more coherent book for people to understand, and then sort of went from there. Great. You begin the book with a critique of the pithy eat less and move more strategy that is seems to be beloved by so many experts. You point out that it sounds like a perfectly reasonable approach for weight loss. However, telling patients to eat less and move more has generally been an ineffective strategy. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah. So the eat less, move more uh, strategy is uh, sort of a calorie-based model. And the whole thing about the calorie-based model is that people think that it's inevitable that if you simply cut your calories, which is eat less, you're going to lose body fat. And they say, oh, well, this is the energy balance equation. Sometimes they say, um, oh, it's the uh, first law of thermodynamics, right? And they think that they're being very smart. But the problem is that if you look at the energy balance equation, which is that body fat equals calories in minus calories out, what they don't... What they don't always understand is that there's here, it's one, a a caloric deficit never exists, right? Because it's a balance equation. You have three variables and they must balance. That's, that's why it's called a balance equation. So body fat equals calories in minus calories out. There's three variables there. Body fat, calories in, calories out. If you reduce one of them, so you reduce calories in, then you might lose body fat. That's a possibility. But that's only one of the other two variables. You could just as well reduce calories out, which is your basal metabolic rate. And body fat would remain unchanged, right? So you you have three variables. You change one of them. One of the other two could change. And the problem is that if you look at the past sort of 60, 70 years of research, what you realize is that if you eat the same diet, you just eat fewer calories, less of it, almost always your metabolic rate goes down. That is, if you eat, if you take in fewer calories, so lower calories in, what happens is that calories out also goes down. So the amount of energy you expend also goes down. So you're eating less, but you're burning less. And therefore, you're not going to be losing a lot of body fat. And so this, this sort of, you know, what they, people always say with the, the calories in, calories out crowd always says is that, oh, it's just the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics doesn't tell you anything about where that energy c- comes from or goes to, whether or not when you eat less, do you lose body fat or do you simply lower your metabolic rate? It's just like if you, um, you know, you, you have a job and you lose your job. So your income goes down, you lower your expenditures. That's what you do because you don't want to drain your bank account. Body's the same. You all of a sudden are putting less in. It's going to put less out. And of course, it has to happen because if you have somebody who weighs 200 pounds and they want to lose weight, so you say, okay, eat 500 calories less per day, you're going to lose a pound a week. Does that mean in 200 weeks, they're going to weigh zero pounds? Well, obviously not. So therefore, they're, they're, energy expenditure, like how many calories they burn, must eventually go down. Turns out it's almost immediately it goes down. Just like when you lose your job, your expenditures almost immediately go down because you're not stupid. You don't want to drain your bank account. Same thing. The body's not stupid. It doesn't want to die. So energy expenditure goes down. So we have probably, you know, I don't know, 
40, 50, 60 studies that all show exactly the same thing, that simply cutting your calories or eat less just re- results in you burning less. And therefore, body fat doesn't go down lower. So this whole eat less uh, advice is, you know, one, you can see physiologically why it doesn't work. You have the experience of sort of 40, 50, 60 uh, research studies that have all shown exactly the same thing. And you have the practical people's experience, which is that when you tell people to simply cut their calories, your failure rate's about 99, 95, 99%. That's why doctors don't tell people that anymore, because they know it never, ever, ever works. The problem is not that they're not following it. The problem is that the strategy doesn't work. But then what the doctors and a lot of other people do, especially the fitness people, they wind up blaming the person and saying, well, you're not losing weight because you're not following the diet. It's like even if you follow the diet, in the studies, people follow the diet. It doesn't work. But we blame the the patients for not following the diet because they're not losing weight. But what they don't understand is that it never causes weight loss. So it's a very bad situation where people are not losing, they're, they're taking the advice, the standard advice, they're not losing weight even though they're following the diet, then they're getting blamed because they're not losing weight. It's like, well, it's the bad advice in the first place. And I point out that, you know, there's a lot of doctors, and I know a lot of doctors, a lot of my friends, most of my friends are doctors, and some of them are overweight. And people say, oh, you know, it's they don't have willpower. It's like, no, I know these people. These people went through medical school. They went through, you know, working 36, 40 hours at a time, you know, without a break. Like these people have a lot of willpower. It's not a lack of willpower that's causing them to gain weight. It's the lack of eating the right diet because the advice that we gave them was probably just not very good. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research organization investigating a broad range of topics aimed at understanding and extending human cognition, locomotion, performance, and resilience. As you know, there's this substantial experiential evidence that the eat less, move more approach is not particularly effective advice for individuals, particularly those in an environment that promotes being sedentary while surrounded by hyperpalatable, calorie dense, low protein foods. However, this doesn't necessarily imply that an integrated calorie balance model is incorrect, just that it's ineffective. It sounds like you believe that this recommendation is also not efficacious, that even if people reduce calorie intake and increase calorie expenditure through more movement, they will not see weight loss. However, extended fasting is obviously the most extreme version of caloric restriction. And with extended fasting, you'll also see a decrease in metabolic rate. So can you sort of bring together these different thought processes you have? Yeah, in terms of the metabolic rate, they've done a number of studies on metabolic rate. So first of all, of course, calorie restriction clearly causes a decrease in metabolic rate. And people always say, well, fasting does it even worse. That's why you're going to go into starvation mode. That's not actually true. So if you take a person, and so I took you, Tommy, for example, and I fast you for four days, give you nothing to eat for four days, measure your basal metabolic rate before, and after, and they've done these studies, and it turns out that after four days of zero calories, you're burning actually 10% more calories per day. And you might say, well, why is that? It's quite easy to understand because the body, when you don't eat, insulin goes down, but other hormones go up. So things like uh, the sympathetic nervous system gets revved up. So you're actually, your body's not shutting down. It's actually revving itself up even after four days of nothing to eat. And the thing is that if you're going to increase your sympathetic nervous system, and it's mediated mostly by things like adrenaline, noradrenaline, you're going to increase things like cortisol, you're going to increase things like growth hormone, then your metabolic rate is going to go up. And that's the whole point. Like, it, you know, people think that if you don't eat, your, your metabolic rate necessarily goes down. In some cases, it goes down, others it doesn't. But the main thing is to understand what are the hormones that are getting changed, and is it really going to affect it. So the whole um, the whole thing is that if you look at 
certain some of the studies of intermittent fasting, they show the same thing. That is, you get less of that decrease in metabolic rate. In terms of calories, I mean, the whole problem with calories is that you're ignoring a huge part of what causes weight loss and weight gain. That is, and, and, you know, the calories in, calories out, people always say it's just about calories, but it's not. Food contains also a lot of instructions as to what to do with the calories, right? So food contains calories, which is energy, and it also contains instructions, which is that our body will respond to foods with hormones, which tell the body what to do with those calories. And for example, insulin will go up very high if you eat cookies. And if you eat an egg, then it's not going to go up. So what you do with those calories is quite different because if insulin is very high, you're going to want to store a lot of those calories away, store it as glycogen, store it as, as body fat. Whereas if you eat an egg or meat or something where insulin is not going to go up quite as much, then that leaves the calories available for you to use as energy. So whether you store those calories or you use those calories for energy is quite different. And that's going to play a big role, for example, in metabolic rate. Because if you have a lot of calories available, then you're going to be able to use them. So fasting is not just about calorie restriction, which is what I hear a lot. Oh, it's just calorie restriction. It's not. It's about allowing the hormones to get to a point where insulin is going to fall so that you can allow your body fat to be used as a source of energy. We know, and we've known for at least 50 years, that insulin inhibits lipolysis. That is, if insulin is high, you, your body, you're telling your body to store energy, not to take it back out. Because body fat, remember, is simply a store of calories. So if you're telling your body to put the energy into storage, you're not going to take the energy out of storage. So therefore, insulin inhibits lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat. So how are you going to lose body fat if your insulin is high and you're telling your body you can't use it? It's sort of like, you know, if you have money in the bank, but the bank is closed. You can't get that money back out of the bank, right? So if your fat stores are closed, you can't get the fat out of the fat cells well, you're not going to be able to lose body fat because it's closed. Same thing. That's what insulin does. It locks it off. And then everybody worries, oh, you're not eating enough calories. Like, why would I worry about the 2,000 calories you're eating in a day if you have 200, 300,000 calories sitting as body fat? What adjusting the hormones does is allows you to access the energy right? So it's not just about the calories. It's about what you do with those calories, right? Just like if you make money, if you make a lot of money, hey, you must be rich. But no, a lot of professional athletes, they make a lot of money. They're completely broke. They're bankrupt because it's what you do with that money afterwards, right? Do do you just invest it or do you just spend it frivolously? Same thing. You take those calories, your body has a choice. Do you use it for energy or do you store it as body fat? And that makes a huge difference as to how much body fat you have. If you look at the amount of calories that Americans were eating, so Ansel Keys, when he did his famous starvation study, starvation to him was 1,570 calories. That was a huge drop from previous. So a lot of Americans were eating, you know, 2,500, 2,800 calories a day, yet there was almost no obesity. But of course, there was very little processed foods, right? So their body was just using it, obviously, because they were not gaining or losing weight. So the point is that it's a lot more complex. Like people try and simplify it into just calories. It's just calories, just calories. There's a very, very simplistic way of looking at things that, that sort of ignores the complexity of the human body. Remember, calories only measures a single thing. It's a unit of energy from physics, not physiology. What your body does with that energy depends on the hormones. Everything in our body depends on hormones. So how can you simply ignore it? I mean, this is where people say, well, you know, a calorie is a calorie. You could eat ice cream for dinner as long as you don't eat your broccoli because it's the same amount of calories. It's like, you know, if you ask your grandmother, she's be like, you're an idiot if you think you can eat, a, eat ice cream for dinner and not gain weight. And the whole thing about this idea that food contains not just the energy, which is calories, but also instructions or information, all it really means from a practical standpoint is that some foods are more fattening than other foods, which is actually just common sense. Cookies are more fattening than broccoli. That's all we're saying, which is hardly like earth shattering, but to the sort of calories people, they're, they're, they're dead set that broccoli is calorie for calorie is just as fattening. 
And it's like, I don't think so. I don't think it's true. When you eat two foods, 100 calories of cookies versus 100 calories of broccoli, the hormones are demonstrably different. You can measure the insulin and you can tell you exactly the difference between those food, two foods. Now you have to say, and then you have to say, well, we're just going to ignore the hormonal difference that is irrelevant to body fatness. Like, why would you say that? Why? It doesn't make any sense to me to ignore the difference in hormonal response to these two foods of the same calories. And that's what I, I, I talk about is that there's a lot going on behind the calories. Calories are like the body has no calorie receptors. It actually has no idea how many calories you're eating or not eating. In fact, the only thing it responds to is the hormones. When certain hormones goes up, it goes, does this. When certain hormones go down, it does this, right? So it is directly controlled by hormones and calories plays very little role, an indirect role. Yeah, the whole discussion has become, I think from both sides, rather pedantic. Obviously, a calorie is a calorie, right? Like a pound is a pound. People don't eat calories, they eat food. And calorie, as you said, is a measure of energy or heat. And yet, if you wear a continuous glucose monitor and you eat a pile of cookies and you eat a pile of broccoli, you'll see a very different response. So they're, yeah. they're, these are sort of two separate issues, really. Yeah, when they, people say a calorie is a calorie, what, you know, it obviously is true. But what they're trying to say is that all calories are equally fattening. I understand that. Is a calorie that, but, of cookies but, is, a, yeah, exactly. And that's, the, that's what they're trying to say in this sneaky way that says, well, you know, obviously a calorie is a calorie, right? But what they're trying to imply is that all calories are equally fattening, which I don't believe is true at all. I, I think they're actually quite different. So, because nobody ever asked, did I, like, did I ever ask the question, is a calorie a calorie? Like, no. My question is, are all calories equally fattening? And, and to me, that, that the, well, the answer they have is that, yes, they are. All calories are equally fattening. What you mean to say is, are all foods equally fattening, right? So the, are all foods, right, yeah, because yeah. certain calories... A calorie is just a measure. From different foods. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So are all calories... Are calories from different foods equally fattening? Yeah, because certain foods are, you know, 100 calories of cookies has a different hormonal response than 100 calories of broccoli. Mm-hmm. You know, following yeah. up on this, we had uh, Mark Matson on STEM Talk, who talked about his recently published book, The Intermittent Fasting Revolution, The Science of Optimizing Health and Enhancing Performance. During the interview, we talked at some length about a paper he had recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine that highlighted how studies in animals and humans have shown that eating in a six-hour window and then fasting for 18 hours has been shown to have quite positive effects on lifespan and a wide range of chronic disorders, including obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and neurodegenerative diseases of various kinds. However, a recent paper that also appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine reported that a year-long study among patients with obesity found that a regimen of time-restricted eating was not any more beneficial with regard to reduction in body weight body fat, or metabolic risk factors than daily calorie restriction. So here we have in the same journal, two papers with opposite results reported. And I wondered if you could give us your take on this recent study that uh, found no difference. Yeah, the, uh, that recent study was problematic to say the least. So the problem was, of course, that the study is fine. I, I, I support the research, but then people took that study and simply went to town and said, oh, there's no benefits to fasting, but that's not really what it, the study was saying. So if you look at the study very closely, what they did, of course, was they did, you know, calorie restriction and then time in the added time restricted eating. So there was two problems with it. One, the study design was bad, which we'll get to in a second. But two, um, the, it was very much underpowered. So if you look at the sort of time restriction, it was a 16-hour time restriction. If you look at the control group, their time restriction was about 13.8 hours, I think. So the increase in fasting period was about 16%. When they do a power calculation, because when you ever have a negative study, there's two possible things. It can either be negative, there can be no effect, or you can be underpowered study, right? If I did a study of three people, you wouldn't find a significant difference because you just don't have enough power. So you have to look at the power calculation. Um, so they calculated, uh, they assumed 
that time-restricted eating would increase weight loss by 2.5 kilos, or about 6 pounds. That's even though calories were exactly the same in both groups. Uh, if you look at the actual sort of weight loss, and it was about 6-something kilos in the control groups, which is not bad for, for you know, like 10, 12, 14 pounds, which is not bad for a year-long study. But if you're going to lose an additional 2.5 kilos on top of that, you need to have a 40% increase in weight loss in order to be positive. So that's 100-something uh, patients, 130 patients. So that's their power calculation. So they use that power calculation to, to recruit that 100 people. So in other words, for a 16% increase in fasting period, you had to have a 40% increase in weight loss in order to be positive. Anybody who does clinical medicine will tell you that ain't going to happen. Like, I'd love it if it would happen, but it won't. That's not going to, that's just not, like, you're not going to get like two and a half times the effect just from fasting. Perhaps you might if you had a difference in calories, total calories, because remember, calories still plays a role here. But the thing is that they only showed a 28% increase in weight loss and therefore is a negative study. But it's so so when you look at it is it is there truly no effect or was it underpowered and what people of course jump to the conclusion of is that it was there truly is no effect of it but really it's just an underpowered study the claim because wasn't you did show an effect the claim wasn't there there was no effect it was that it was no greater effect than there was no greater effect than right. calorie restriction right. alone exactly but you needed to have a 40% increase in your weight loss just from that 16% increase in your fasting time, right? So it, it, it's, it's just way out of line. Like the, the power calculation they did was like you, it needed to be so powerful. Fasting had to be so powerful, like nothing you've ever seen before sort of thing. Because in addition to this sort of 12 pound weight loss, you had to lose another six pounds on top of that. Like, it's just not that easy to get people to lose weight. So it, it was sort of underpowered. The other thing is that, and this is a little bit more technical, is that when you set up a study, so fasting does two things, of course. It does, it, it adjusts your hormones so that insulin is falling, so that you're allow allowing your body to use body fat. And it restricts calories, right? So there's two effects. One is the calories, the other is um, the other thing. So if you have a study you know, in this case, you have two things. You have calorie restriction versus calorie restriction plus time-restricted eating, and you show the same effect. That's good study design if you're looking for independent variables. But if fasting produces some of its effect through calorie restriction, then it's not a very good study design. So let me give you an example. Say you have a drug like semaglutide. Semaglutide is a very effective weight loss drug. It causes people to lose about 17% of their weight. It probably causes most of its effect on because it suppresses your appetite and causes calorie restriction. So if you did a study where you said, I'm going to use semaglutide plus calorie restriction versus calorie restriction alone, you'd probably find the same amount of weight loss. Would you then conclude that semaglutide is ineffective? Um, probably not, because that's what allowed you to eat fewer calories. Same thing with the fasting. If fasting is a way to eat fewer calories, then it's still an effective intervention. It's in fact a root cause of your calorie, of eating fewer calories. It's what causes you to eat fewer calories. And we know this because when we do studies of time restricted eating and don't tell people to count their calories, people eat about 500 fewer calories per day without restricting calories. So there's a couple of things. One is that they're, they're, they're not independent variables. And two is that it's an underpowered study. So the conclusions that you can make from that study are less than what were made. Of course, it got sort of blared out on the New York Times that, hey, fasting has no benefits. That was, I think, the exact headline. Uh, fasting has no benefits. It's like, okay, well, you know, I, I can't help what people think. Right. I can only point out that fasting is a way to both eat fewer calories because that's what our studies show. If you restrict the time you spend eating, you will on average eat fewer calories because you have less opportunity. And that's okay. That's part of its effect. The whole, um, 
you know, the whole idea is that you're putting in, you know, you're restricting your, your hours, which is very easy to calculate. If you say, I'm going to only eat eight hours of the day, that's easy to calculate. It's from 12 to eight. Boom. If you say, I'm going to cut 500 fewer calories, it's, it's a mess. Counting calories is a mess. Because you don't know how many calories it is. If you eat a piece of salmon, you actually have zero idea how many calories are in that piece of salmon because there's no calorie labels on natural foods. So therefore, you're either eating a bunch of processed foods, which we know are bad for you, or you have no idea. You eat a piece of chicken. How, how many calories are in that? You don't know. It depends on how it was cooked, what's in it, what the sauce is with it, right? It's so variable. You don't know how to count that. So calorie counting is super, super imprecise versus counting hours, which is extremely precise. So it's a much easier way. It's a much more logical way for somebody to structure their eating day. So to say that it has no benefits is sort of to me, well, you're sort of taking this study, this underpowered study that really wasn't designed correctly and sort of just running with it. Like saying that these drugs have no effect. These weight loss drugs are completely ineffective because it's got no additional benefits compared to weight loss alone. Or saying that, well, weight loss surgery, it's ineffective. It has no additional benefits compared to calorie restriction alone, which it probably won't have. Right. Well, but we're back to they the. Still have benefits. We're back to the discussion we had earlier about efficaciousness versus effectiveness. Mm. I mean, this is exactly back to it. So perhaps exactly. intermittent fasting is a more effective method at reducing calories, as well as all the other effects. Uh, it has, yeah, it has. It, you know, certainly a lot of it. You have to argue. I don't know, but I suspect that there's additional effects, but a lot of its benefits are going to be related to energy restriction, which is fine, but it's a way to do it, right? It's what allows you to restrict energy in a sort of more natural, easy to follow way, as opposed to just counting your calories, which is very, very imprecise. According to the model you presented earlier, the calorie restriction group in this study shouldn't have lost any weight at all because they just restricted daily calories. Uh, over six months to one year, you always lose calories. It's when you follow out to three, four, or five years. You all, every other, every study, like your women's health study, all of those studies, you get you get a really great effect at six months, and then at a year, it's a little less good, and then by two, three, four years, you've just completely lost all benefits. Like a women's health study, for example. 300 calories a day less every day. So every day, 300 less calories. At one year, you still had pretty good effect. Six months was the maximum. At one year, you still had pretty good effect. So if you do short-term studies, calorie restriction is very good. But by, I think, five years, there's no difference than between the people who simply ate their usual diet and the people who restrict their calories. It's a low-fat, low-calorie diet, right? So uh, if you do a short enough study, like this was a one-year study, you, you'll definitely find it. In fact, it's great for one year, but, you know, one year of weight loss, you know, it's, it's not the health benefits of that are, are questionable. Okay, so we've agreed that calorie restriction is efficacious. It's just that it's not effective in the long term because it's hard to stick with because the women's health study didn't provide all the meals. They, they, it wasn't a fixed number of calories and they then regained weight. It's just, you just, it's difficult for people to do long-term. It's very hard. Uh, people don't know how well, many their, calories they're eating. Their metabolic rate will go down over time as well. We know that too, right? So if you go from 2000 calories to 1700 calories, you're going to lose weight for six months. It's going to start to go back up a year. If you measure at a year, you'll still lose weight, but your metabolic rate has gone down. So therefore, you're losing less and less weight each time. And at some point, you just plateau. And that's everybody's experience. So when, when people's weight plateaus, people always assume that they've just fallen off the diet. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think some people are still following the diet. Their metabolic rate has just gone down. So now is probably a good time to talk about your third book in what has been referred to as the wellness series, uh, The Cancer Code. I hear you undertook this book because you find the story of cancer to be so fascinating. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, it's it's really about... So I, I, I sort of was looking at cancer from an obesity standpoint, just sort of this, because there's a number of obesity-associated cancers that are sort of uh, well-known. You know, I, I was looking at it from that standpoint. But then 
as I started to look into sort of the what cancer is, how it develops, it, it was this really, really fascinating story of how cancer develops and it's how it's quite different than what we had always understood, which is that it's this sort of genetic errors. You have mutations and oncogenes and tumor suppression genes, and therefore this gives you this, you know, thing that grows. Turns out that that paradigm, that genetic paradigm, has been sort of blown up uh, in the 2000s, and it hasn't really been effective. And once again, when you have a, a paradigm that's sort of trying to tackle the genetics of cancer, you really have to look at, does it give you drugs that treat cancer? And the answer really is no. So it started out great. We had a couple of really amazing drugs, Perceptin and Imatinib, that you know, really tried to correct the genetic uh, problems of cancer. And that was in the sort of late 90s. And in the last sort of 20 years of, you know, this explosion of genetic knowledge, the number of drugs to treat cancer from this genetic paradigm, like you could, there's probably only like five or less. So five drugs in 25 years is not going to change cancer much. And it was because this idea that you would find one mutation which causes one cancer sort of isn't true anymore. There was actually more than a few mutations. It turns out that each cancer has hundreds of mutations, 50, 80, 100 mutations each. And they're all different mutations. So if you have one patient who, you know, who has cancer, he has 80 different genetic mutations. The person next to him, which has clinically the same cancer, may have 80 completely different mutations. So this idea that you can just find the genetic uh, causes of cancer, then cure them, it was sort of blown apart. And that was, um, that was very interesting. And, and what's sort of replaced it is this sort of evolutionary paradigm of cancer where you treat cancer more as an evolving sort of species as opposed to just a bunch of genetic mutations. Mm -hmm. And using that sort of paradigm is actually much more successful in leading to all these new treatments like immunotherapy and also reconsiderations of our old therapies. So think things like the abscopal effect, which you, is that you can use radiation in con and combine them with these checkpoint inhibitors, for example, that might have more benefits, or using whether you need to use maximally tolerated doses, which is, you know, whacking patients with as much drug as you possibly can. Maybe that's not necessary, because just like antibiotics, you don't necessarily have to use the strongest antibiotic for the longest period of time. Sometimes that's actually counterproductive. So people are looking at sort of lessening the dose, and that gives you not only less side effects, but actually may keep the patient in control a lot longer. So really interesting stuff that coming uh, coming out from there. And that's this this story is a bit of a uh, bit of that. Following up on that, as you mentioned, there's obviously a genetic aspect of cancer, but our environment also plays a substantial role in the development of cancer. And in your book, you point out that a Japanese woman who moves from Japan to San Francisco doubles and sometimes triples her risk of cancer. Now, the genetics are obviously the same, but the environment has changed. What is it about the environment here in the U.S. that's such a risk factor? But really, perhaps more tellingly, what is it about the environment in Japan that is so beneficial? Yeah, it's it's probably due to the diet, and this was recognized for decades, really. Got sort of lost in this whole genetics focus of cancer because, of course, it's sort of like the seed in the soil. So, you, you know, you have to have both the seeds, which is the genetic material, but also the soil, which is the right conditions in which it's going to flourish. So probably the diet in the United States plays a big, big role in allowing breast cancer, in this case, to develop. And you see it in other cases, too. The people in the far north, the Inuit, people had a virtually none of these lifestyle-associated cancers. And then as they became more westernized, adopting sort of our lifestyle with, you know, uh, flour and refined uh, sugars and that kind of thing, you started to see this great, huge rise in uh, cancer. In fact, in the 30s and 40s, the university in Canada used to send an annual expedition 
to see why these people were immune to cancer. Turns out they weren't immune. They were now, you know, their rates of cancer are actually similar to, to ours. And it's all due, obviously, to the, uh, the environment. And it's probably that one is that the obesity and cancer are linked in terms of hyperinsulinemia. Insulin probably plays a huge role. So not only is it important in terms of obesity, in terms of type 2 diabetes, but insulin is a very potent growth factor. So if you have a very potent growth factor, stuff is going to grow. Breast cancer cells, for example, have an incredible amount of insulin receptors, which is, um, you know, normal breast tissue doesn't. So if you have a lot of insulin receptors on this breast cancer cell and you put it in a situation where there's a lot of insulin, well, it's going to be able to take full advantage of that and grow because it's going to take the glucose in, it's going to have the energy, it's going to use the energy to grow. So not only does it have the nutrients, it has the signaling, the growth signaling from the insulin itself. So therefore, so the hyperinsulinemic diet is probably going to play a role in terms of risk of breast cancer. So you see that in Japan and China. So in Japan and China, at the time anyway, they had much, much less obesity. They still do in Japan. China's catching up quickly. But that sort of diet where they're not eating the same foods, they're not eating the same quantities of food, is not allowing them to, those breast cancers that to, to, to develop. The genetic code, the seed is there, but the, the soil is much different. There's also uh, some evidence and, that ketogenic diets, as well as fasting during chemotherapy, may reduce the side effects of the treatment. It is generally beneficial. Can you talk about how fasting may increase the efficacy of chemotherapy, or at least uh, the tolerance of it? Yeah, so fasting is quite interesting because, of course, a lot of cancer patients lose weight. So therefore, you have to be very careful in using it. But one place where they have used it successfully is in chemotherapy. So in chemotherapy, what happens is that you give a drug that kills cancer cells, but generally does it by killing all rapidly dividing cells. And so that's why you get hair follicles are rapidly dividing, the GI tract, the epithelial cells divide rapidly. So therefore, you get a lot of nausea, you get a lot of hair loss. And when you fast for the 24 hours prior to chemotherapy, what you do is put all those cells into a more quiescent state. That is, if there's no nutrients coming in, then the cells are going to slow down their growth. That's just naturally what they do because insulin is a growth factor. So they're going to grow slower. And by growing slower, they're going to be less affected by these toxins that affect the cell cycle reproduction. Cancers can't do that because, of course, they're uh, on this sort of grow, grow, grow sort of pathway. So therefore, you're going to lessen the side effects by fasting the sort of 24 hours before and after uh, chemotherapy, which is the regimen that they use, which is very interesting because then they say, well, then, you know, you're going to be allow people to get their full dose of chemotherapy because sometimes you have to scale it back if people have too many side effects, but you're going to be able to, you know, lessen the side effects of that drug, but you're also going to be able to make sure that you give enough of the drug and then really hit those cancers hard with the chemotherapy. So that's one application of fasting. Mostly it's in a more preventative area. So if you do a lot of fasting and you're able to avoid sort of obesity, then you're going to be at less risk, presumably, of obesity-associated cancer. Jason, I know your work takes up a lot of your time, and we appreciate you breaking away to talk with us today. But I have just one last question. I understand you weigh about the same as you did in high school, which has a potential downside. Not too long ago, I hear your wife finally got fed up with a pair of ragged-looking jeans that you had been wearing almost since high school and threw them out in the garbage. <laughs> so this uh, begs the question that I'm sure many of our listeners will want to know. What does your diet look like, and what kind of fasting protocol do you follow? I tend to be flexible in it. So uh, most of the time I skip breakfast. Um, and that's that wasn't a weight thing. That was started in medical school because I was just tired and I wanted to sleep. So therefore, I wanted to sort of wake up, roll out of bed, and then jump right in five minutes later. I was in hospital sort of thing. I didn't want to wake up an extra half an hour to uh, get breakfast and clean up and all that stuff. So I just skipped breakfast naturally. It was just a lot easier <laughs> for me. Uh, but that was more laziness than anything else. But it became my habit. So that was easy for me. And then uh, what I do often is, you know, if I'm uh, busy, I'll just skip lunch as well. So that gets you into a 24-hour fast. And I do that two times a week, three times a week, something like that. 
but it's flexible. And that's one of the advantages of fasting is that you can really use it when you want. So for example, during the holidays, I'll very often not fast for a week, you know, between Christmas and New Year's, for example, because there's all kinds of things that are going on. um, And you don't want to be a big party pooper all the time. But then I'll do more afterwards. So it's flexible, I might do a little bit more before a holiday, like if I'm going on vacation, I know, okay, I'm going on vacation, I'm going to wind up eating a lot of stuff I shouldn't be eating, I know that, but I'm going to do a bit fasting before I'm going to do a bit more fasting afterwards. And then that allows you to be flexible in terms of your diet. And that's how I think a lot of people did it. If you look at a lot of traditional sort of regimens, they'll have periods of fasting through the year, right? And 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 uh, it's it's not always that you have to do it sort of every day or every week. There's a daily schedule that you follow. There's a weekly schedule that you follow. And there's like a yearly schedule that you follow. A little bit more coming into the summer, for example, I'll do a little less at other times. So it, it's always flexible. And then in terms of the diet, the main thing is, uh, again, I just try to avoid the processed foods as much as I can. So if you're, you know, trying to eat, you try and eat things that are natural as opposed to the sort of processed fast foods all the time. So I think if you stick to that, like avoiding the sugars, avoiding the the processed foods, I think it gets you a long way to a good diet. And I don't think that there's that much controversy in that. I'm not necessarily like I'm not totally a ketogenic uh, diet, but you know, I tend to be a little lower in the carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. I tend to eat a little less of the bread and so on. Mm. Well, if you're fasting, you are practicing a ketogenic diet. In fact, that's the original ketogenic diet is starvation. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the, the point of it, right? I mean, if you're, if you're uh, trying to lose weight, then you've got a store of calories. So you want to let your body use it. So just give it the time that it needs to, to use it. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. It's not that complicated. Like, you, you know, it's just a store of calories. But you have to let it open up. Okay, so Tommy had one last question. Now I have one last question. Speaking of questions, we get a lot of questions from our listeners about rapamycin. So uh, what is your take on rapamycin and how currently do you see the risk reward ratio uh, playing out there? This is a topic of increasing interest, particularly by the physician uh, listeners. The rapamycin is an mTOR inhibitor. Um, There's a lot of people who feel that mTOR is sort of really important. It's so it also is a nutrient sensor predominantly with regards to amino acids. Um, it, you know, it tells the body that there's protein coming in and may play a role in some sort of aging and cancer. So certain types of cancers, there's mTOR inhibitors like rapamycin that are used. Um, so the idea, and there's not a lot of sort of good data on rapamycin for longevity because longevity is just incredibly difficult to study because you know it's either unethical or it's so long that you just can't you can't measure it right it's too expensive so you wind up using all these secondary endpoints which are very sort of iffy but um, as an mTOR inhibitor it potentially could affect certain parts of aging, and that's where a lot of people are very enthusiastic about it. It's not a very new drug, so there's a, a bit of experience with it, but it's mostly used in immunosuppression or chemotherapy, so not really the healthy populations that, that other, most people are interested in now. I don't know what to think about it because I just don't have that much data. There's also a mm-hmm. whole other... There's also a whole other part of the community that says, well, you should eat high protein and high protein, of course, is going to really stimulate your mTOR. So on the other side, there's a lot of people who say, well, you should eat more protein to prevent Mm -hmm. sarcopenia. Well, you know, that's going to raise your mTOR. So there's a lot of conflicting opinion on that because should you lower it? Well, if you're going to lower it with rapamycin, then maybe you should eat a lower protein diet. And that's what all the vegans say as well. Yeah, I would never listen to vegans. The the, the thinking currently, uh, and, and there's a burgeoning very recent literature on rapamycin, as you may know, particularly around Matt Caberlin and do- the dog studies. But the current thinking is pulsatile, a strong pulsatile activation of mTOR is a positive thing with respect to body composition and avoiding sarcopenia. But uh, like, yeah. uh, you know, an intermittent reduction in mTOR activation is what they're doing. But anyway, I just wanted to know if you had a strong view on it and 
given that you don't, that's fine. I was just wondering, you know, some people are very hard over in one way or the other. So we were curious what your view was. Right. Yeah, I don't have a strong opinion. It's hard to know. There's good good researchers on both sides, and uh, the mm-hmm. pulse tile thing makes sense to me as well. Yeah, I, I think so. That's natural, right? I mean, uh, for a fasting person, it ought to make sense to you, right? So yeah. ketogenic diet says... As well as fasting, which I said really is a ketogenic diet, strongly inhibits mTOR, and there's probably a benefit there related to autophagy and, and other things. So uh, right. it, it makes sense in the context of your work as well. Thanks so much again, uh, Jason, for joining us today and your additional insights. Uh, the, the final questions right right at the end there. We, we really enjoyed this. Yeah, and thanks, uh, Jason. We appreciate <laughs> you, so you taking the time from your busy schedule. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. STEM talk. 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 There are still people who think intermittent fasting is a fad, but I think anybody who listens to this interview with an open mind will see that there is tremendous potential in fasting and that the success Jason is seeing in helping people reverse their type 2 diabetes is really quite impressive. As Jason pointed out today, and as I've pointed out when I was a guest on the show previously, 88% if not more of Americans are metabolically unhealthy. And if people want to improve their metabolic health, they really need to seriously consider fasting as well as a low-carb diet. Absolutely. As you know, Tommy, helping people get off their insulin medication is a wonderful thing. And Jason and many others have noted that type 2 diabetes is to a large extent a dietary disease and would benefit from a dietary solution rather than only a pharmaceutical solution. Jeff Volick, for example, who was our guest on episode 43, is also having tremendous success at helping people reverse diabetes through a company called Verda Health, where he is the chief science officer and a founder. If you enjoyed this interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes at stemtalk.us. This is Tommy Wood signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others, so please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.